My name is Dr. William Padula, and I'm going to be presenting today on the consequences of traumatic brain injury or neurological event causing visual processing dysfunction. I'm going to be presenting some research which is going to document that these are brain dysfunctions of the visual process, which have been termed post-trauma vision syndrome and visual midline shift syndrome. In order to understand this, we have to look at vision as a dynamic process as it emanates or grows from the action system, which involves movement, posture, and balance. And then we'll have to understand how that in becomes a key relationship to organization of vision in, re in response to cognition, memory, speech, and language. Anytime there is an interference with the motor process, even with uh, aging, it interferes with parts of the visual process which affect uh, how the visual system is stabilizing other aspects of performance, such as movement, posture, and balance. And when that becomes affected, frequently there will be problems with balance, eye strain, light sensitivity, and even vertigo production. Neurovisual process dysfunction affects posture, balance, spatial orientation, and then affects higher attention concentration and causes binocular. The dynamics of vision behind this are often misunderstood. Vision occupies so much of what we see, it affects how we think. We tend to think of our visual process in terms of what we see, but this is only a small component of what vision actually is. Vision has a strong relationship to how it organizes from posture and movement. To understand the implications about this, we have to look at vision in terms of how it's processed in the brain, how the development organizes motor movement through the visual process and vice versa, and then visual processing as it maximizes and organizes the relationship of cognition to reach higher levels of potentials. To understand how we can re rehabilitate the visual process, we need to create a model of vision, but this is going to require that we make a paradigm shift in our thinking and recognizing that we can utilize lenses and prisms not just to improve sight or muscle function of the eye, but actually change the process of vision in the brain, which then produces interaction with the motor system, affecting balance, posture, and movement, as well as affecting cognition. This model of vision is going to lead us to an understanding of two specific areas of research that I had the opportunity to conduct, one of which is called post-trauma vision syndrome. I first found this syndrome when looking at how the visual process was affected by traumatic brain injury, but I now realize that post-trauma vision syndrome can be affected by any neurological condition, even tick-borne disease. And when there is a spatial visual processing dysfunction, it can affect posture and balance, increase risk of fall, and it will affect how the person orients to being upright against gravity. Understanding this, this model of vision will then lead us to understand that we can utilize the relationships of visual processing in rehabilitation by providing specifically used prism, sectoral occlusion, and lenses, as well as special approaches in neurovisual postural therapy. Neurovisual processing rehabilitation incorporates the, the applied principles of movement and posture to understand the visual process and then the applica application of lenses and prisms to affect posture and movement. Looking back at some significant research in the 20th century by Trevarthan and others, they recognized that the process of vision encompassed two components one of which was called the focal visual process. This occupies our visual attention. It's our image. It's in relationship to detailed discrimination, identification. 
It delivers attention and concentration. It's very much oriented to the time present. It's a conscious portion of the visual process. But this is the second part of the visual process that we have. And developmentally, this was the second component established. The priority of the brain is to establish first a spatial visual process, or that which is called the ambient visual process. And the purpose of this system is to organize spatial orientation for posture, movement, and balance. This part of the visual system is not interested in the conscious nature. It's proactive and pre-conscious. It's there to anticipate change, to constantly create the flow forward from where we are. These two visual processes are important in development. The spatial process always precedes the focal process, and it shows that in development. The child organizes postural orientation to gravity before attention. As the spatial component organizes and sets a platform base, then it enables the higher portion of the visual process to work from that platform base with cognition and recognition. This bimodal visual process the relationship by how we can create the paradigm shift. The ambient process is integrated with the kinesthetic, perperceptive, and vestibular processes. It must create organization of vertical and horizontal awareness through the peripheral visual process, taking vertical and horizontal lines and send this to a level of midbrain to match up with the sensory motor system, bringing information from proprioception about what it feels like to be upright against gravity, matching it up with the vertical horizontal lines. It feed forwards this to the frontal lobes, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe, essentially to pre-program these mapping areas prior to the image being received from the focal process. The spatial visual process, therefore, is pre-conscious and proactive. It feeds forward, and then it receives feedback from the higher cortex. The spatial visual process is a relative process. It's never interested in the moment of what we're looking at. It's always interested in this relationship to the proprioceptive input of organization to be upright against gravity. And any change in the proprioceptive system enables the spatial visual process to constantly adapt to the environmental changes. Whereas the focal process can adapt. So if the spatial visual process becomes compromised, we now have a focal process that becomes very unadaptable, very rigid. The plasticity of the visual process and how we adjust ourselves in relationship to posture and movement, and even adjust our thinking, is all in relationship to the plasticity of the spatial visual process. So that the understanding this paradigm shift is that these two processes, the bimodal visual process, must remain in balance throughout our lives. These two processes are very much like the boat that you see out here in the harbor. You see the boat, but what you don't see is the rope that goes down to this anchor, which stabilizes the boat. That spatial visual process provides the stability and the anchor support of our visual process. If that rope was cut, you'd still see the boat, but the next tide would cause the boat to drift out to sea. Interfere with the spatial visual process, and you will create problems in how this, the focal process becomes organized. This graphical component uh, of showing the visual process demonstrates the spinal tectal tract bringing up a considerable amount of rich spatial information from the proprioceptive base of support, which is matched up at the level of the midbrain with the spatial information from the periphery of the eyes. Feed forward then goes up to the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, occipital lobe, before that image from the macula 
and image from the rest of the retina of both eyes can be delivered to the occipital cortex. The spatial and focal process are organized as bimodal process and they can serve the visual process but not separately. The lower portions of the brain, the midbrain and brainstem, are critical to support the spatial interface for higher cortices. The higher cortices must organize the conscious nature of the visual process, but also give feedback to the midbrain and the brainstem to readjust and create the alignment and organization for plasticity. Some interesting pieces of the cortex rel relate to how the visual process and how the cortex is organized. The neocortex is the outermost layer of the cortex. It relates to 2.5 millimeter thickness of the entire contour of our brain. And you'll notice here that on the left, the mouse brain has very few convolutions. The monkey has more convolutions. The human cortex maximizes the, the spatial area of the cortex by increased convolutions. The neocortex has six layers. The first three layers are myelinated and are to deliver axons and fibers to other neocortical layers in the brain. Layers five through six are important because they receive input and give output to the midbrain and brainstem. So half of the neocortex is in relationship to receiving and providing output to the midbrain and the brain stem. However, the visual neocortex, an additional three sub-layers have to be added for a total of nine layers in neocortex. Not because more information has to be relayed to other parts of the cortex, but because there is more input coming in from the brain stem and midbrain and more output so the additional six layers are necessary to have this type of communication. So if you exit out of... System is jammed. So can I get a playback on this? I have to go all the way back. The microphone side. Let's discuss what happens to the visual process when a portion of it becomes interfered with. It leads us to discuss a syndrome termed post-trauma vision syndrome. This was published in Brain Injury in 1994. The research was termed visual evoked potentials to evaluate PTVS in patients with traumatic brain injury. I originally did a study at persons with traumatic brain injury in relationship to a control group. There were 10 subjects in the experimental group and 10 subjects in the control group. The etiology for the subjects in the experimental group for head injury with the majority were secondary to motor vehicle accident. The control group, none of the subjects had any type of traumatic brain injury. All of the subjects in the experimental group had reduced monocular and binocular acuities, not so in the control group. The experimental group showed problems with tracking, convergence, unlike the control group. It was interesting that in the phoria range, the experimental group showed a high prevalence of exophoria, but it was mixed in the control group. The refractive state showed a high evidence of myopia, where it was mixed between myopia, hyperopia, emetropia, and astigmatism in the control group. All subjects in the experimental group had problems with focusing, not so in the control group. We conducted visual evoke potentials because we hypothesized that we could capture the effect of a compromised spatial visual process looking at the amplitudes of the P100 under binocular conditions. 
pattern reversal on binocular conditions. There is a relationship demonstrated demonstrating that the amplitude N1P1 is sensitive to the compression of space. Base in prism provided before the two eyes causes a